I mean, one one of the most frequent comments after my Life of Bob Marley multimedia show are people coming up and saying, I know you're not going to think I'm crazy when I say this, but I got to tell you, Bob Marley's music literally saved my life. I've heard that so many times that I got to believe it. Music has the power to heal. Mm -hmm. So how'd you find out about me? I've known about you since I was a kid. I think the first time I saw you was in the Rebel Music documentary. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think I was five at the time, and they played it on PBS late at night. Uh-huh. And that was the first time I saw you. Oh, wow. Yeah. But I do have the book. <laughs> you do. <laughs> yeah, but you haven't seen this. Oh, this is the first and only book about Bob Marley in Chinese ever. Wow. <laughs> All the blurbs are in Chinese. Oh, well, the whole damn thing is in Chinese. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I had to prove to the editors that Rastafari wasn't a religion or else the communist Chinese government would not allow the book to be published. That sounds they about right. They don't recognize Rasta as a religion. And I, it's a way of life. So that's that's how I presented it to them. Yeah. Let's start with the Jad years. Okay. Yeah. That's a side of the story that's always been overlooked. And it's a very, very interesting and strange era for the Whalers. Yeah. So what can you tell me about, about that? Well, there's a lot of stuff in, in the book about the Jad years, because I ended up working for, for Danny Sims for about seven years in the uh, late 90s and the early O's. And um, he was a self-proclaimed mobster. I don't think he was a made man, but he was a mafia adjacent for his whole life. Mary, my wife, once called him. She said, you know, Danny, I've always thought of you as the godfather. And he just preened and he says, really? Wow, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and I, when I was putting together the complete Whalers box sets with Bruno Bloom, the the 15 disc series that connected Coxon with Island, all that middle period, I I wanted something and I asked Danny if he could get it for me. And he says, I could get you anything. I'm a mobster. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Danny. So um, we talked a lot over the, those years about the initial period. Um, Bob was looking to break to the black American audience. That was his primary goal i would say for a long time um and and they listened to an awful lot of american rhythm and blues and, and rock and roll and danny had tremendous success in in the uh, 60s with johnny nash and lloyd price who was a business partner of his and bob saw this as a way to break the american market and Danny released a lot of uh, the the early Whalen Solem songs on Bob's own label uh, in America in in different mixes. A lot of them were recorded at the Atlantic Studios in New York City with Aretha Franklin's band, and these were you know top flight studio musicians, just the best in the business. But they didn't really understand reggae. They they didn't really know how to play reggae. It was inside out to them. And um, so the, the mixes that Danny tried to get American radio to play in the late 60s just didn't make it. And this was a, a time of great psychedelic experimentation in America, too. And this sounded old fashioned. This sounded, you know, 50s Memphis stacks kind of stuff. And uh, it, it couldn't get airplay. And that was very frustrating for Bob. Um, and Danny, after four years of trying to break Bob and the Whalers, um, finally gave up and sold uh, Bob's contract to CBS, to Columbia in, in England. And they did that misbeguided single of uh, reggae on Broadway. Um, if, if they had called it reggae on High Street, it might have been a minor chart success in England because they don't have broadways. They got main streets or high streets. And and then he had to end up 
buying it back and selling it to uh, Blackwell in in 72. Um, but he kept the publishing through 1976, and that was a very lucrative period with a whole lot of songs that Bob wrote that he released under other people's names with the express idea that it would be denying Danny Sims any of his two-point override on everything. <laughs> and uh, that created legal problems after Bob died, tremendous legal problems. But Danny, you know, what was what was unsaid uh, about that period was the tremendous influence that um, that Johnny Nash had on Bob as a performer, as a singer and teaching him mic technique and breathing techniques and uh, projection and, and uh, harmonies. Uh, they, they became very, very close friends. And, and Johnny thought or B Bob thought Johnny had the voice of a. Uh, a bird, a beautiful bird, uh, and uh, was was deeply influenced by by Johnny, and um, he he sang a lot of songs that uh, Jimmy Norman, one of the writers um, at at the Jad label, had written for for Johnny, and uh, because he thought Bob and Johnny had voices in the same range, and uh, so that awful mistake the the worst song bob ever recorded maybe one of the only bad songs was uh um milkshake and potato chips we didn't even put it on the uh, complete whalers box set <laughs> <laughs> i did read that in the book yeah that, about that so i still haven't heard it yet <laughs> no you don't want to don't don't, <laughs> don't put that in your head zeb you don't you don't even want it in your head i'll take your word on that <laughs> yeah. yeah you're missing nothing <laughs> <laughs> so you know that, that had a profound effect on bob and uh, at the end of his life when when he lost faith in in don taylor his manager and almost killed him in uh in gabon uh, danny came back in the picture and so did um uh, so did uh mortimer, mortimer plano um, with whom he had had a falling out. In fact, uh, both Joe Higgs and, and uh, Family Man Barrett told me that Bob tried to hang himself once in Plano's yard because Plano was was being so gravelicious toward him. I did not hear about that. Yeah, there's a lot in that book that nobody's ever heard before. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of it's because it took me 15, 20 years to get people to talk to me. And a lot of these people were near the end of their lives and uh, wanted to set the record straight before that knowledge died with them. So Leslie Kong was the first producer um, Bob worked with. And then later down the road, they did an album with him. Yeah, 1970. And that was the best of. <laughs> yeah and that story was confirmed by bunny you know uh, he told him not to call it the best of the whalers because they had a whole lot of work in front of them and nobody will know what the best is until a long time ahead and if it's the best of the whalers to you it means it's you're not going to be around for much longer and then he dropped dead mm -hmm. <laughs> young man i think he was only about 38 oh really yeah so the words of Bunny Whaler, they were listened to in a different way after that. Now, you mentioned Joe Higgs. Oh, yeah. Joe Higgs was one of the very first stars in the earliest days of ska. In fact, before ska ever started with his partner, uh, Roy Wilson, Higgs and Wilson. They even were on the Ed Sullivan show once. They won a contest and appeared on Ed Sullivan. And um, this is Joe's red beret that he wore all the time. He's wearing uh, it in this picture, although the picture's fading. <laughs> <laughs> and he was one of my dearest friends. I, uh, In fact, I did the eulogy at his funeral here in L.A. He taught the Whalers how to sing. He was the most profound influence on them as youngsters. Um, taught them all the rudiments and was a hard taskmaster. You know, he'd, he'd rehearse a harmony, and if they didn't get it right, he'd rehearse it over and over and over and over again. 
and mm-hmm. he even brought them uh, uh, so they got over their stage fright. He brought them at night to uh, rehearse in a, in the Maypen Cemetery. Right. You know, <laughs> if you can play for a bunch of duppies, you can certainly play for a bunch of yabos in Trenchtown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I, and he he had a a great love of jazz music he and Seiko uh, the percussionist for Bob and the Whalers who brought Bob to his first audition at Cox and Dodd they they were jazz heads they were a little older and um Bob had knowledge of a wide wide range of music through the musicians he was hanging out with so he was a very sophisticated man from from very early on he he had the luck and and he had the desire to learn and and soak up all of this musical energy and he was always trying to make himself better you know that 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 perseverance he didn't just burst out of nowhere into international stardom by the time he really started getting famous it was 1975 and he'd been recording since 1963 right and even when you do just like a retrospective of of his work and then you think of the timeline it took him over a decade to to break internationally yeah yeah and his, his story is really like a roller coaster ride it's ups and it's downs I mean, he did two solo singles for Leslie Kong that went nowhere. Uh, and then uh, he he gets into the the best studio in Jamaica, brand new studio that Coxon has just built in, in 63, 64. He records Simmer Down. And he's he's with the most successful producer of his time. And the guy has great promises to them and never never paid them more than two figures a week. And it was usually more like three pounds a week each, no matter how many tens of thousands of records they might be selling at the time. And that was a tremendous frustration. So, you know, he finally took the group away from Coxon in 66 and went to America to earn money to start the Whaler's own label. And they figured, well, now we we have control of our, our music and our pressing and our publishing and everything like that so it's going to be fine we're going to reap the rewards for our own work but they never could get enough money in front of them to to really establish a a house and a studio where they could all live together and create together day or night and they ended up going to to leslie kong who had had tremendous success with my boy lollipop and the israelites and they figured, okay, this guy knows how to sell a million records to the world. And then he up and dies on him. And the record is stillborn. And then Danny Sims, concurrent with, with Kong, Danny Sims came in in 68, and he's got the international market. No, he's knocked it out cold with Johnny Nash and some other artists of his, and he He's got the best musicians in the studios in New York, and he knows what doors to knock on and whose palms to grease, which is probably the most important thing. And he still can't break Bob. He tries for four years to break Bob. Can't do it. So that great promise is dashed again. And CBS, and they release that stupid reggae on Broadway record, that does nothing for him. And finally, in desperation, they go to Chris Blackwell. And Blackwell gives him eight grand to make an album, which was the weekly cocaine budget for Eric Clapton. <laughs> and they produce a masterpiece. They produce Catch a Fire. And the critics come on to them. And it wasn't until they broke big in England that the people in Jamaica started paying serious attention to the Whalers. And that's a fact. You know, they had the Heptones. They had all those early artists and groups you mentioned before. Bob was just one one of many. The Whalers were one group of, of many really good groups. And then the British latched on to them, and the live album came out in 75, and they were huge stars abroad now. 
And so Jamaica started to pay attention to them. So <laughs> that was it was a 13 year battle. Yeah. And then they lost money in the process. He didn't want to tour. He didn't want to play freak clubs. Right, right. Where, where, where Blackwell wanted to send him. And, um, you know, to have all that labor among the three of them seemed to go to waste. And I was mad at Blackwell for a long time. I used to work for him. I was the national promotions director of Island Records in the early 80s. And I was pissed at him because he almost seemed to take a joy in having broken up the whalers. But what we got was three times the amount of music we would have had otherwise. Mm -hmm. And when you look back at their breakthrough albums, like Legalize It for Peter and, and my God, Black Heart Man for Bunny, one of the top five reggae albums of all time, and, and uh, Bob's first solo album, Natty Dread, those are Whalers albums. Yes. Whalers albums, because each of the three Whalers is on the other one's album. I've always seen it the same way, too. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really think Bunny did anything worth listening to after Liberation in 1987. It was all garbage after that. I'm trying to get dance hall stuff. and Nah, he lost it after that. He made a song in praise of Dudas, the head of the shower posse, responsible for th literally thousands of people being murdered and God knows how many uncounted people getting addicted on his terrible drugs on crack cocaine. And uh, they called him the president in in the ghetto. And Bunny made a record when they were trying to expel him uh, to the States to be tried. And that civil war broke out in Tivoli Gardens. Uh, Bunny Whaler made a record called Don't Touch the President. I mean, that would be like Bruce Springsteen making a record like Don't Touch John Gotti. Just amazing to me that he could stoop to those levels. And the fact that he didn't write Dreamland. Dreamland was written by a guy named Al Johnson yeah, uh, for a group called El Tempos. And it was two years before Bunny recorded his version. And, and Coxon himself told me he gave that record to Bunny to cover. And it was called My Dream, My Dream Island. So he dropped off a couple of letters and it became dreamland and every time somebody covered it like marcia griffiths or third world it always appeared with a writer's credit of neville o'reilly livingston bunny whaler's name and mm -hmm. he didn't write a note of it it's note for note word for word dreamland my dream island by el tempos it's up on the internet all these years he's complaining about being ripped off by this guy and being ripped off by that guy. He's ripping off this guy's royalties for 40 years. I mean, I wouldn't know what was going on in his head, but do you think he was maybe thinking, well, I've been ripped off so many times, maybe I'll do a little ripping off of my own? Oh, I think that's the Jamaican attitude toward everything. You know, they ripped me off from my people for 400 years. It's time to get something back. That's why every island in the Caribbean is run by gangsters. No, I mean, that early work of his solo work was was brilliant. Mm -hmm. I mean, he wrote a lot of masterpieces. But, you know, I had a dear friend, my mentor in Hollywood, a man named Waldo Salt. He wrote Coming Home, The Day of the Locust, and he wrote Midnight Cowboy, won two uh, Oscars. Uh, was blacklisted in the 50s. He was a commie. Oh. He, he told me one night, he says, listen, talent is no guarantee of character. That is so true. So you don't always want to meet your idols. Better let the work stand for them. Snow Mass, 1994. My parents were there. Oh, wow. So they saw the double rainbow. Yes. But I I heard it from their side. I want to hear it from your side. Well, I was the MC, and I, I had to bring him out three times before he came out. And that night when we went back to the hotel, I said, Bunny, what 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 were you doing? I bring you on stage, and then you don't come out. What, what was going on? He says, well, man, me look at them rainbows, and me see Bob on top. Peter underneath. 
and the spirit just moved me in a way me can't me can't move me can't move and uh, he was he was emotionally overwhelmed by that and it wasn't until the third time i announced him that he actually came out on stage it was embarrassing but it was it was funny too and the next night I did a show in Durango and a man who had lived in, in Colorado his whole life, older man, came up to me and he said, you know, I was there at the, at the show in Aspen and um, I have never in my whole life seen a rainbow like that. It was so intense, both of them, so, so deep, so psychedelic. And um, I uh, I kind of feel that same way, too. Yeah, that was before I was born. So um I oh, wish I lucky to see that. That was that was an incredible show. And Vision Walker was playing in the band that night. Yes, I and I do have photos. I will I will send you those. Um, oh cool. Yeah. That's a picture I took that day at Snowmass. Right, right. But this, you know, it's full color and it's got a deep blue background kind of like your background here uh that people think is the sky but it wasn't it was a blue tarp on the back of the stage because it yeah. worked at most of that day yeah that festival it was um that was a world music festival right but it was mainly reggae yeah. acts right yeah yeah because i know um one of them was uh a band called boom shaka right that, they're that played. Played. yeah well, Boom Shaka was one of the first wave of L.A. reggae bands in the early 80s. Our reggae show was the only reggae show on the air for years in Los Angeles, the reggae beat that Hank Holmes and I did. And uh, in its wake, uh, a lot of local groups started uh, to form because more and more artists from Jamaica were coming up to town. I think between 83 and 86, L.A. was the hottest reggae city on earth. Uh, one, two, three artists a week, every week for three those three years. Then the dance hall came in and the gunmen came out from Miami and Brooklyn and changed the whole nature of the scene. That's when I quit the reggae show at 87. Um, but uh, Boom Shaka and Small Axe and uh, a lot of other really fine rutical bands formed with uh jamaicans coming to live in la uh half of the soul syndicate band the drummer santa davis who had played for bob and and for peter and uh, fully fullwood the bass player and tony chin the rhythm guitarist they, they've lived here since the early 80s and they helped form a lot of bands and 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 just teach the the local people how to play the music they were, they had a profound influence joe higgs the father of reggae who taught the Whalers had to sing, lived here from 1984 to 99 when he passed away. Uh, and he he coached so many young uh, black Americans uh, in, into how to play the music properly. And um, that that made a big difference. And a lot of a lot of our, our local bands went on to play behind international reggae stars like Don Carlos and tour the world with him. Yeah, yeah, it was an exciting, very exciting time when Peter Tosh came over and uh, I brought him to Hank Holmes' house and Hank had all these instrumentals from England released under the name Peter Touch that Peter had no knowledge of whatsoever. Mm. And, uh, and couldn't even figure it out until we played one of them, I think, four times. And he remembered, and he says, man, I'm upstairs in Studio 17, at, at VP in Kingston, and I'm just doodling around, warming up on the organ. And they're taping me. And then they took those tapes to England and added musicians to them and released them under Peter's name. Really? Yeah. And you don't remember which one it was, or...? Uh, offhand, no, no, because there were a whole pile at Hank's house of, of these singles, right? Yeah. Oh, okay, and that was 40, 41 years ago, so uh, no, 43 years ago. And you know, I'm getting old now, I'm 80, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's going. <laughs> I loved Peter, Peter and I were good friends. 
he didn't have any of his own records that had all been stolen or borrowed and never returned or um so he would call me three or four times a year from various parts of the earth wanting recordings of of my my singles mostly and um he called me you know just a few days before he died because he wanted he had just released no nuclear war and he wanted to start work on his new album and he wanted to remake a single he did for joe gibbs around 1970 called here comes the judge which was about all the worst villains of history Bartholomew de los Casas and Henry Morgan, the pirate, and all these people. And he wanted to update the song with the names of the current bad guys in Jamaica. I, I really wish I had known what, what names he planned to do. Um, and I had so much fun with Peter. Uh, that that was the side he, he rarely revealed to the public. You know, when the camera was on, he put the, the darkers on, the shades, and he had this deep, deep voice that could be very intimidating. And um, he scared people. Bunny Bunny got very mad at me in one of the documentaries for saying Peter was scary. He was. But, you know, he he wanted to scare Babylon. You know, they were right to be afraid. You know, Peter Peter took no, no prisoners when he spoke. And... Um, but privately, he could be so funny. You, do you have the um, um, honorary citizen box set? I was going to talk to you about that long box. Yeah, yeah, had it a long time ago, but well, they, they re-released it in a smaller package. They they redid the book as a CD sized book. But I wrote the book and I, I assembled the singles on the first disc. I worked a long time with with his uh, niece with. Uh, or his cousin, rather, Pauline Morris, on that box. And, uh, oh, uh, yeah, I had a whole page called Words of the Herbalist Verbalist, because I loved Peter's deconstruction of the language. He was like some French philosopher deconstructing the words. And, and in fact, you know, be careful of your friends. They will fry you in the end. Well, that's cutting that word in half and seeing what it means. And it was a putative friend of his who killed him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he called the judge the grudge. And uh, his producer was his reducer. And he, uh, he called the Queen of England, Queen Ear Lies a Bitch. <laughs> Ear Lies a Bitch. <laughs> 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 I, I learned that one the week after the book went to press because that would have been the top of the list if I had known about it then. And he, he said he played in in Follywood, Hele, San Francisco, California, United States of Asadica, because there's nothing <laughs> merry about America. It's Asadica. <laughs> I just love the way his, his brain worked. Yeah. You could really hear it in his songwriting. You know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He loved language. Yeah, and just just a heavy thinker. And he said he didn't need school because he was self-educated. And if you knew what uh, education the word meant, you would know that it comes from the Latin "educo" to bring forth from. So who taught the first teacher? That mm -hmm. was one of, that's one of the things he said in our first interview with him. The first time my kids ever saw me cry was the night Peter was killed. How did you hear about it? His manager, Herbie Miller, called me, and it was maybe an hour after he, Peter was killed. Wow. Oh. He just knew how much I loved Peter, and it was all. We were both crying. Mm-hmm. We've lost so many great people way before their time. You know, life is really cheap in Jamaica. Well, we need to talk about the obvious. Tabby Diamond. Oh, that was awful. Awful, awful, awful. He was a really good friend. He was on my show many times. I've got some beautiful photographs I took of him on the first major tour they did in 1980. Uh, he was a, just such a gentle, so a gentleman, and and so full of love, and and uh, you know he was the Jamaican Smokey Robinson. 
and um, senseless, senseless. They couldn't. They couldn't kill his son, who evidently had killed somebody. So they went for him. That's what happens, you know. If they, it's like you know what the Russians and the Chinese do. If they can't get you, they'll get your family, and hurt you that way. Mm -hmm. You got a favorite diamond song? Oh, oh, the one, the one off of um, Deeper Roots, the the song called Black Man. Deeper Roots, yeah, yeah. So, so many classics. From oh God, I mean, you know, the, I need a roof album is is like a greatest hits album. Yeah, every single track, like Black Heart Man was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no bad tracks. Yeah, you could play it start to finish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm curious to find out more about Tyrone Downey. So, what what can you tell me? Well, he was. He was just a kid, but he he was very precocious, and and he he had incredible talent that Bob recognized, and he actually uh, started hanging around with Bob in in the early seventies. But you know he was he wouldn't be able to travel abroad or uh, <laughs> do adult things un, until he got a little older. So he didn't join the band until nineteen seventy five, and uh, you know he plays some. There's beautiful licks on, uh, on No Woman, No Cry on the Live at the Lyceum album. And, um, and a troubled man. He he did get taken down by my friend Joe Mennell, the film director, uh, to the bottom of the Grand Canyon in the summer after Bob died with Bob Marley's mother. And some of that footage is in Rebel Music. And... Um, he he rode a horse for the very first time at the bottom of the Grand Canyon with dreadlocked Indians. And uh, they did a little show with Bob's mother singing uh, for, for the Havasupai tribe. Um, they regard Bob Marley as the reincarnation. I've got to get this right. I think it's Crazy Horse. It's either Crazy Horse or, or Red Cloud. I think it's Crazy Horse. They think Bob Marley is the reincarnation of him coming back as a black man to lead the red man forward to his freedom. And uh, in in years after that, he had a lot of trouble with, with bad drugs and was just in the depths. I mean, he was living in the street. Wow. And um, he he had ill health for a long time, but... He he got better. He started recording some projects in in Europe that never got made, but the the basic tracks are still in the can. I, I just got a hold of him recently, um, and he he was trying to come back, uh, but he had you know he'd abused himself so badly that his his body was shot. So it's it's almost a miracle that that he lived to be I think sixty six years of age. Um, if fame and success can be a double-edged sword mm -hmm. there were so many bad drugs in Jamaica and the music business in the 70s and 80s once once Siaga's people came into power and they became a transshipment point from Colombia to the states and other places for crack and other bad drugs But a great musician, a great, great man. I, I always had a nice time with him. He was very smart. And, you know, when 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 he was cogent, he, he was he was one of the best. Oh, yeah. I mean, have you ever seen the interview with I did with him? Yeah. Yeah. Where he talks about, you know, escaping the murderers. And Selassie appears in the mud to him, like two inches tall. You got to lose faith now, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> now that that's one of my all-time favorite interviews, and he was just—he was a delight to be with. He was so much fun. Uh, I I think he talks about yeah, he talks about roots, the roots juice that he had. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, and uh, me clutch me roots to me chest, and all of a sudden the buckle burst. Like a used heart. 
I mean, who talks like that? <laughs> um, you know, he. Uh, I, I saw all the shows he did in L.A. I emceed most of those. Um, it, just, you know, a wonderful guy. I don't know what I can add that, that you don't know about him. But uh, that night I did that interview, he he went out that interview was late afternoon and he went out with a woman i know and uh, basically i think killed a bottle of scotch before the show and when he arrived at the show he was almost passed out he was drunk oh and he came out on stage and he just well before he came out on stage they they took all the cans out of this bucket of ice and poured the ice water over his head to try to sober him up. So he came out on stage soaking wet and just lay flat on his back on the stage with the mic like this and sang the first three songs like that. I never saw anything like that before. I've never talked about that before either. Wow. Yeah. But it's so ironic that, you know, you know, he said if, if they had killed me, you know, he's talking to the gunman and he says, well, if you kill me, two more are going to come and take my place. My son, right now I have a son, and he will take my place. And, of course, he was on the road with, with Joe when Joe died and took over the band from that night forward. Well, that's the best uh, thing about poetry. It, uh, poetry depends on the on the reader, on the listener. It's what you bring to it. You can't say it means only one thing, especially with Bob's songs. There were so many wonderful uh, metaphors. I think of uh, she had brown sugar all over her booga wooga. Um, that's about a cane field worker. Mm. Uh, the base of the sugar cane is is dark brown and it it's really useless. You can't eat it. You can't do anything with it. Um, and the farm workers, the field workers in Jamaica, wear these cheap canvas shoes called booga woogas. So if you see a girl in Kingston with brown sugar all over her booga wooga, you know she's a cane field worker coming into town. So it also means that. Also means that. <laughs> <laughs> that was told to me by a very, very good friend in Jamaica. And um, Clinton Hutton, who's a brilliant painter and professor at the university, now, when I did my first Life of Bob Marley show in Kingston, I told that story. And uh, afterwards, I was talking to Clinton and I said, anything you want to correct about that? And he just said, don't you change a damn word. <laughs> <laughs> so we have it on good authority. <laughs> good. <laughs> By the way, I have to tell you, and you can break the news. Okay. Today is a very, very special day for me. I have been trying to find a buyer for my archives for 45 years. First people who tried to buy it were in 1987, the Schomburg Institute uh, for Research and Black Culture of the New York Public Library. Quote, unquote, that's the title of it. <laughs> and they tried to buy the archive back in 87. So that was 45 years ago. And I've had several serious offers since then. But my bottom lines have never changed. I want it to be kept intact forever. And I want it to be made available uh, to everybody uh, while respecting all the artist rights. And um, I have found a buyer and it has been hinging on the sale of land in Montego Bay, where the Sumfest Festival is held. And the man who owns Sumfest is an old friend of mine named Joe Bogdanovich. His cousin Peter was the Hollywood film director, last picture show guy. And um, Joe is wealthy, and he loves Jamaica. He bought the Sumfest Festival a few years ago, and he... Today, after four years of negotiating with various Jamaican governments, signed the contract for the land in Montego Bay, and we're going to build a museum to house my collection there. He's bought the archive, and he's going to share it with the world. So 
you know, I feel like popping a bottle of champagne or lighting a big spliff. <laughs> <laughs> so that museum is going to keep these people alive and it's going to show them the international spread of their music all around this planet. I was interviewed a few years ago by Phil Kogan, who does The Amazing Race. You know that TV show? Yes. And he's been to 130 countries. And he said in every one of those countries, well, that's ironic. Our, our radio show was on 130. Oh, I, no, I, I don't know. Ah, <laughs> oh. and he wanted to know, you know, every single one of these countries, he's found evidence of Bob Marley in. Seen posters or pictures or heard bands or him being played in a club somewhere. And he wanted to know why. So he came and, and did an interview with me about that. And uh, yeah, yeah, Bob, he's he's not going to disappear, man. He's a forever artist. The The Beat magazine declared him, which means me, uh, <laughs> declared him the, the greatest musical artist of the 20th century. And then I was pleased to see that uh, among those who agreed with me uh, was the New York Times. At the end of uh, the last century, they said the the most important artist of the first half, uh, musical artist of the first half of the 20th century was Louis Armstrong. And the second half was Bob Marley. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I, I don't remember ever seeing a Louis Armstrong or Louis Armstrong uh, T-shirt anywhere. <laughs> you know? <laughs> It's great that, that there's young people like you out there. I keep looking for them because I'm I'm 80. How many years do I have left? And I, this this generation is what's going to keep the roots alive. And I want to turn you on to my, if you don't already know him, Sol Ramirez. Have you heard of him? Uh, He's no. A He's a Tosh expert. Okay. And uh, has been working for years to try to put together an album of all the uncollected instrumentals, the organ stuff and the melodica stuff that, that Peter did. And I've been helping him with that. And we've got the backing of the estate. But the the rights, uh, the clearances are, are a, a major problem, uh -huh. especially with stuff that were basically bootlegs that Tosh didn't even know he was doing <laughs> <laughs> and, um, that that project has moved along uh, a lot lately and uh, Saul I think is just 19 years of age and I want to put you two guys together you need to know each other he he has a depth of knowledge like like you're showing me here today and that it just makes my heart sore to know that there are people like you out there 